Okay, we're going to start it. This is the uh, May 19th Mari Cognitum virtual chapter meeting for the Moon Society. Uh, I'm Ben Smith, and let's go. So, agenda. Going to go through the news, talk about some volunteer opportunities. Jim's going to give us a presentation, and then we'll have an open discussion. Okay. News. Need a presenter for June 16th. Um, if we don't get one, I'm, I'm going to keep trying to get somebody. If we don't, we'll see what happens. Uh, we need a new chapter leader for our virtual chapter because I'm not going to do it after June. So if anybody wants to pitch in, great. We will be holding our Lunar Development Conference in July. Uh, Nicholas, correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going to be the 20th and the 23rd. The 20th right. to commemorate the Apollo 11 landing, and then the 23rd, because that's on a weekend, so more people can attend. Um, Nicholas is running point on that, and if you want to help out, get into Slack and contact me, him, or just in Commons, and we'll hook you up. Yeah, and I, I, I work fairly closely with Buzz Aldrin. He comes to a lot of our events and has been a speaker and so forth. So, you know, we can get him engaged. That would be great, yeah. Yep. Nicholas, you need to talk with Jim, see if you can yep. hook us up. I doubt Buzz would come to our tiny <laughs> LGC, but you never know. We got we had his son come last year, so uh -huh. maybe that would be the, the thing to get going. All right. Um, we have one open seat on our board of directors. Um, the rules are you got to be a member for a year and you must be willing to stay up to date and participate in monthly board meetings. Uh, we also have open, semi open positions for president and vice president. Both our president and vice president have said that they have other things going on and can't spend as much time. They haven't officially resigned, but they would be happy to if somebody stepped up and wanted the position. So. Lots of other positions are open. You can check the website for that. We're still working on our revised vision, mission values. If you're interested in helping out and just wanted some input, get into Slack and we'll hook you up with that group. And of course we do all our work in Slack. So if you want to find out what's going on or get involved, uh, join us in Slack. Instructions are on the website. There's a list of some of the opportunities, lots of open positions, lots of areas for people to volunteer. Um, again, get into Slack and contact us if you're interested. All right, so tonight, Jim Crisafuli, did I say that right? Crisafuli. Okay, I, did, I didn't put enough Italian into it. Crisafuli um, is going to talk to us about ACES Worldwide, uh, promoting an innovative partnership of space-related organizations from around the world. So, let me stop, share that. Let me share this. We were having trouble getting Jim's slide to present, so I'm going to screen share from my computer and Jim is going to do his presentation and let me know when to advance. Yeah, I'll just say next slide. Take it away, Jim. Well, mahalo for the opportunity to uh, speak with your team and uh, look forward to working with uh, your visionaries uh, as uh, time progresses. And we look very strategically going back to this little thing on the end of my finger. <laughs> but uh, ACES Worldwide, uh, well, let me first say aloha from Hawaii and uh, mahalo for this uh, stellar opportunity to discuss our visions for this, this program, uh, the Alliance for Collaboration and the Exploration of Space. Um, let's go to the next slide. Um, yeah, I, I, I think we all agree that uh, humanity is now embarking on a, a most innovative and inspiring era of space exploration and development. Uh, both public and private space institutions, educational and training organizations, and regulatory agencies worldwide are now pursuing truly innovative approaches, technological, financial, and governmental, that could help expand and diversify uh, pioneering space enterprise. But opportunities are also being explored to apply space-related technologies and resources in most creative ways 
that ultimately could significantly help both improve and sustain life on our own planet. Uh, next slide. Um, ACES Worldwide is a space-related alliance that was established to enhance international space ventures that ultimately could help make space enterprise more collaborative and environmentally uh, sustainable. Known as the Alliance for Collaboration and the Exploration of Space, uh, ACES Worldwide's primary goals are to help promote both public and private space ventures, to expand and diversify space education and training programs, uh, to enhance a broad range of space safety standards, and to advance the long-term goals of sustainable space activities, ultimately helping to make these more equitable and affordable, to expand their significant environmental benefits, and to help accelerate timetables uh, for peaceful space enterprise that ultimately could benefit nations worldwide. Uh, next slide. Uh, the AC's worldwide vision. Uh, this international, this is a multinational, international space initiative that's focused on engaging not only major spacefaring nations and their space agencies, but also developing countries, multinational space organizations, um, entrepreneurial and private space enterprise, diverse educational programs, and a broad range of not-for-profit organizations. Uh, ACES Worldwide is now reaching out to both spacefaring and non-spacefaring nations, to space agencies and other space-related organizations around our planet. This includes, but certainly not limited to, members of the International Astronautical Federation, uh, participants of COSPAR, and all members and observers of uh, UN COPOLIS. Uh, several international organizations currently supporting this effort include Space Renaissance International. I don't know if you folks know Adriano Altino, but he's a very visionary fellow. He and his, his team, including uh, Bernard Foyne, who's now their new president, uh, are very excited about this opportunity. Uh, McGill University's Institute for Air and Space Law, uh, the International Association for the Advancement of Space Safety, and International Space University, among other organizations. Uh, next slide. Um, a variety of uh, key space-related issues are currently being addressed by ACES Worldwide, beginning with space safety, with an emphasis on public safety during launches, controlled re-entries, uh, commercial space flights, and hypersonic transports, um, environmental protection and sustainability relating to space debris, atmospheric and ground pollution in both nuclear and radiation protection, um, ground personnel protection from space operations, as well as aborted launches, um, space situational awareness to enhance both space traffic control and on-orbit on services, and uh, both promoting and enabling widely applicable global space standards and regulations for space operations as well as uh, you know, a special near-term focus on potential cosmic hazards, as well as planetary defense from such hazards. And I think there's a very high priority for this among multiple space agencies at this point. Uh, next slide. Um, one of these key issues is orbital space debris. Uh, and is, it's another area, key area that's focusing on uh, expanding education, training, and public awareness programs, um, enhancing space situational awareness, uh, active debris removal and mitigation. This is in dialogue with both European Space Agency and NASA, whilst Cosmos are all talking about this. Uh, space insurance and risk assessments, uh, liability conventions and legal constraints, on-orbit servicing, very important now. And the, a lot of the current astronauts are very interested in this uh, area. Space debris reuse for space infrastructure construction, uh, enhancing standards for rendezvous and proximity operations, uh, improving space debris removal and uh, mitigation policies, and issues related to new large-scale low Earth orbit constellations. And again, this is getting a lot of attention uh, in various circles. Uh, next slide. 
Um, space education and training will certainly be key to advancing space enterprise. Uh, ACS Worldwide believes all nations can benefit from space enterprise. It promotes student education and training, uh, enhanced understanding of the use of space technologies and systems that ultimately could help advance economic, environmental, and other key uh, developmental goals. Uh, our team believes that all countries could significantly benefit from space tools and analytics that would monitor uh, global pollution, uh, global weather, and climate change trends, all of which are uh, of, of grave concern to a number of organizations right now. Uh, space education and training will also be key to achieving the United Nations 17 Sustainable Development Goals uh, for 2030 and new teleeducation and telehealth systems that could aid the global south, as well as enhanced capacity building for nations that are in the process of uh, initiating uh, new space programs. Uh, next slide. Um, institutional, uh, legal, and financial arrangements for space initiatives will also be critical for innovative space ventures. This will include new types of, as well as methods for implementing uh, public-private partnerships and international alliances that ultimately could help reduce the costs, enhance the benefits, and hopefully accelerate timetables uh, for future space enterprise. Uh, improved educational and training programs will also be key, as well as enhanced definitions and concepts related to space systems and activities, both of which could help broaden public interest in and engagement with uh, space enterprise. And, you know, we wish to explore ways that could enhance the long-term sustainability of space activities, including uh, environmental policies and regulations uh, that truly could benefit uh, all of humankind. Uh, next, next slide. Um, research related to cosmic hazards and planetary defense is another key area of growing global interest and importance. This includes, but is not limited to uh, coronal mass ejections and solar flares, uh, potentially hazardous asteroids, uh, comets and how to defend against impacts, research on antimatter, supernovas, cosmic hazards, and related warning systems and planetary defense systems, uh, planetary preparedness, and the development of solar shields that will have multiple uh, applications worldwide. Uh, next slide. Um, another uh, related focus is uh, space-related enterprise to enhance global sustainability. Uh, this would include uh, the development of a global sustainability treaty and related space applications and educational concepts, as well as programs that ultimately could help advance the visions such a treaty would inspire. Um, the development of remote sensing and global pollution monitoring concepts, uh, data analytics, and a variety of related educational and training programs. Uh, radio frequency monitoring from space and related environmental applications. And finally, space systems that could address ocean acidity and global warming, as well as systems that could enhance monitoring of global pollution, including innovative ways to address key sustainability issues that are impacting all of humankind. Uh, next slide. Um, yeah, next slide, yeah. Research related to uh, lunar and other off-world settlements is also on our agenda. Uh, we'll be focusing on the moon, on Mars, and on uh, Gerard O'Neill cylinders, a uh, very creative invention that's uh, beginning to move forward. Uh, also exploring the ethics of expanding civilizations into outer space. And there clearly will be a lot of those uh, environmental concerns, property ownership, all sorts of things uh, that relate to this. Uh, developing related technologies that will be required to enable sustainable off-world settlements, uh, exploring the potential sizes of sustainable space colonies, where they might be located, uh, and you know various sizes and 
the pluses and minuses of different sizes and how they could effectively and uh, economically be instituted. Um, potential biological, biological seeds that could grow uh, livable structures in space. And uh, this is a very innovative idea that a number of people are starting to hop on. And ultimately, uh, potential space settlements that are truly independent of Earth, how they could be developed, how they could be governed, and ultimately viably uh, operated. Uh, next slide. Uh, some of the key questions concerning the future of ACs worldwide. How could or should this initiative uh, optimally be administered to help realize its potential contributions uh, to global space enterprise? Can a roadmap be developed to help prioritize and guide AC's worldwide activities and long-term goals? How would this roadmap be developed? Who, who would we engage? Uh, and uh, what, what's a reasonable time frame over which to implement this? Um, what operational strategies might best initiate or enhance global engagement uh, with ACs worldwide? And are there sustainable roles for lesser developed countries and non-spacefaring nations to engage in space enterprise? And if so, how could ACs worldwide help realize these possibilities? There are, they are emerging rapidly as we speak and think about options for the future. And that we really want to explore these in detail. Uh, next slide. So uh, this is the final slide. Many questions still remain to be addressed, but we're confident this initiative holds tremendous potential to help galvanize and sustain global collaboration in space enterprise. Uh, thanks so much for the opportunity to discuss ACES worldwide with your Moon Society colleagues, and we really look forward to working with you as uh, time progresses. Cool. Thanks, Jim. Actually hot. But. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, great presentation. Very interesting. I'm sure uh, we got people who have questions. So fire away, guys. Well, uh, I, I would uh, uh, like to suggest that if there were uh, uh, ways to get material off the moon more economically, that it would help with uh, some of the space problems like space debris. You could put more and bigger Whipple shields in orbit and they would collect debris. Sure. Yeah. So Jim, um, you mentioned to me that um, ACES has a website. Can yeah. Tell me what that is and then it'll be in the video. Yeah, well, it's, uh... It's, we just changed, hold on, let me get to the URL. Uh, just a minute. Yeah, it was just changed. Oops, here we go. Okay, just a minute. Well, we have a, oh, it's, it's really long. It's, it's a webinar for, it's a, it's a a website for our webinar. Uh, hold on a second. Well, go you know, ahead. yeah, yeah. Well, 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 the ACs, the ACs Worldwide website is uh, currently changing, and I'm going to have to email that to you. Um, yeah, I'm going to have to email that to you. Uh, go ahead and email it to me, and I'll. Um... I'll add a slide at the end of the video with it. And then, you know, when, when I post it to our YouTube channel, then it'll be there. And anybody yeah, I've got an AC's LinkedIn website and others. Uh, but the, uh, the, 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 the real simple one right now that you can use, and I think it'll, it probably won't change as we move forward. It's just, you know, HTTPS colon two slashes, um, AC's worldwide, all one word. Dot org. Okay. There's one more slash. So it's it's pretty straightforward. But again, there are a number of others that are being developed, yeah. and that will be. Uh, uh, oh, good. Yeah. And uh, um, this, yeah. So if somebody wanted to help out with Aces, how who would they contact, or how would they get involved? What kind of stuff can they do? 
Sure. Well, they can certainly contact me, uh, but uh, we have an international advisory team that will be reconvening uh, early next month. And they'll be sort of developing a strategy for future development as we move forward. And again, we'd like to do at least one, if not two other webinars um, in the coming, uh, well, by the end of the year. Um, and uh, the topics for discussion are still up in the air, or out in space or whatever. <laughs> but uh, uh, I, I think the, the global team that we've assembled, and which is growing daily, uh, could really make a difference moving forward. Well, but, you know, our, 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 our basic operational philosophy is how can we best foment collaboration rather than competition? Right. And in so doing, reduce the costs, enhance the benefits, accelerate timetables for future space enterprise. So, so is there any way, though, for just your average enthusiast to help out? Or is this basically just more for government organizations? Well, in, 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 in the organization of this, it's, it's more the you know, space professionals. But once we fully <laughs> are operational, um, you know, the world is our oyster. Um, we want to engage anyone who's interested <laughs> and, in ways that, and in ways that can help advance their own professional interests and capabilities. So I'm very interested in uh, what you said about, um, you know, engaging and everything. Like, I love everything that you've said um, about, uh, you know, the things that, that ACES is, is about and everything. Um, but one of your key questions on that slide earlier was, what operational strategies might best initiate or enhance our global effectiveness? And there's a little bit more there too, but... Um, is ACE is mostly, I'm just, I'm in my mind, I'm trying to understand how ACEs and for instance, the Moon Village Association fit together mm -hmm. because uh, those two organizations have a lot of crossover, um, you know, with the, the concerns that you want to address and the things that you want to achieve. Um, well, but, we, um, we, we want to like... be, yeah, we want to be as inclusive and collaborative as possible. And we certainly don't want to duplicate. I mean, I see what we're trying to do. I guess the analogy I like using is a Petri dish with a very rich agar. And you throw some things into it and some amazing creatures crawl out. <laughs> um, but it's, it's, a, um, uh, it's, a, it's, it's catalytic. And, tell me, uh, yeah, tell me more about the seminar that you mentioned when you, know, you were looking for the, for the Earl and you said something like, oh, well, that's our seminar page. I'm very interested. Uh, that's that's sort of my bailiwick is communication and education and things like that. So I would love to know more about a seminar so that I can recommend it to people. Yeah, sure. Well, I mean, talk I talk about it. Well, well I, I can send you way. the links for the webinar that we had uh, earlier, and we're currently in the process of exploring topical options for the next webinar, which next one or two webinars this year. We haven't decided whether it's gonna be one or two. It just depends. You know, we're looking at the <clears throat> international interests and priorities right now uh, and where the key questions that are out there that <clears throat> aren't being resolved but could, could most effectively be addressed through international collaboration. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, how do we do it for, for all humankind uh, in a way that, uh, really can make a difference. And we'll de-emphasize competition and enhance collaboration and figure out a way, again, using the Petri dish model to come up with a very rich agar and you dump all these players into it and what crawls out there are some amazing programs. And yeah. uh, it's not just what you what you do, but how you do it. Right, you know, so, so, so it's, I mean, following your metaphor, that rich agar, that's really the trick, isn't it? I mean, that's, something that we're also struggling with. I'm just being honest with, you know, at the Moon Society and the Moon Village Association and a lot of us, it, it's, you know, finding that 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 rich agar so that all the great ideas that we have, have something to feed them and, and germinate somehow. So like another question I had for you is, um, I, was, I was pretty excited when you mentioned uh, Kopuos 
you know, the uh, Committee on the Peaceful Uses of Outer Space of, with the United Nations. Um, do you, like, what kind of connections do does ACES have with Copuos? Do you guys, well, do you know some people on the committee or? Well, we, we know uh, Dr. Joe Pelton, who is part of our team, uh, has Excellent. been interacting with Copuos for years, and he just finished his 74th book. Uh, <laughs> he's a very prolific space author, and uh, he's, he's the uh, uh, chairman of our team, and I serve as president. And, uh, but, you know, we have, uh, uh, and, and, you know, I, I've sent the international advisory group around to folks and, you know, there are a lot of high level people on there. They're not as engaged with the day-to-day -day strategic operations of how do we develop and implement this program, but they do have connections to the key space agencies and organizations and companies. Ultimately, we hope will come together and in so doing, find out ways to collaborate rather than compete. Right now, there's a hell of a lot of competition out there. Mm. And, you know, competition has its place. Um, it does help ratchet things forward and people amass all kinds of resources, and, but they're, you know, competing. And imagine what would happen if, again, using the Petri dish model, you had a very rich agar and you throw all these people and programs into it, and what crawls out, you know, wouldn't have otherwise. Yeah. Uh, so, and, so it seems to me like the rich agar of Aces is the these the members of Aces who are who themselves are influencers. So it seems to me, I just you know, tell me if I'm wrong. I'm just I'm just trying to understand. Well, well that's certainly part of it. So, yeah. 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 So, so it seems to me that that you know, I mean that that key question that you had meant, of course, Aces is open to other ideas. But right now, one of those operational strategies that initiate and enhance the effectiveness of ACES and moving its its goals forward in an international uh, arena is by connecting and inspiring the influencers who, it sounds like several of whom, a good number of whom, have joined ACES already. So it's, can, it's serving as a, a community to connect and inspire those influencers so that they can influence, you know, in whatever positions they have in a unified way, in a strategic yeah, and, way. And, and, and to demonstrate that collaboration rather than competition is the right C. <laughs> to, That's to, the fourth time you've mentioned that. I, I have to make sure I write that down. Sorry. <laughs> Jim? Yeah. Could you paste the link to your last webinar in chat? And then I'll include that in the slide that I add at the end of the video. Yeah. And then another question is, how are you going to get the word out about future webinars? Because I'd like to be able to let members know that th those are happening. Well, well that, that, me, but. yeah, the, 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 the theme, I'm, 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 for some reason, I'm having problems with my computer and I can't access what you're asking for. I can certainly email it to you sure. as, sure. as soon as I can get it. But, but as, as far as the themes, um, I mean, it's still open. And what we're trying to do is listen to what space agencies and private sector folks like Elon Musk uh, now the richest man in the world, but, uh, you know, I remember Elon and I sat down together at a conference I put on almost 20 years ago, and we sat down and talked for about four hours, and I could see this guy's mind was already expanding in a way that was very creative, and, you know, what we want to do is try and find where are the bottom lines out there for individuals and for organizations that are space, interested in space and find the common commonalities in those visions or those priorities and then weave together again an agar that you know addresses those priorities and demonstrates that by collaborating rather than competing you ultimately can achieve your goals faster uh, less expensively um, and, and, more, and, and more productively ultimately uh, and again, to benefit all of humankind. Okay, well, when you, um, when you decide on your next webinar, let me know and I'll email all our members about that. Sure, know. well, but I mean, 
uh, we would greatly appreciate any recommendations you have for you know topical foci uh, for the webinar that you know key themes that we should be addressing that are most timely and by addressing them be most productive in helping to advance you know what we're trying to accomplish. I uh, certainly you... have some I want to suggest. But oh, I'll, email, please. I'll, I'll email you later. Yeah, please. I yeah. mean, unless you want to talk about it now, but um, well, 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 I'm sure everybody's got yeah. some ideas. Sure. Okay. Um, so I, this is, I mean, I, first of all, Fred, I love what you said about, um, you know, we, we need as many different practical ways to combat the, the orbital debris problem as, as we can possibly think up. I know there's half a dozen right now that are actually being developed um, and that what have funding room. and stuff. Well, that would be nice. <laughs> but um, uh, but like besides things like that and planetary defense, um, it just, it strikes me as um, a bizarre oversight that uh, we've made so much progress in certain very narrow directions in human spaceflight since uh, I believe it was the Gemini 5 or Gemini 6 uh, mission, which was the, the first and only time we ever tried experimenting with centripetal gravity. And I think the rotation was like, like one rotation in like 90 minutes or something. And it was the smallest perceptible microgravity and they had problems with the tether tangling partly because they were spinning so slowly. This is the one where they connected the Gemini craft to the, mm -hmm. to the um, Athena upper stage mm -hmm. and tried to spin them around. And, but, uh, but that was it. Like th there have been so many proposals. It's not like people have not talked about this. It's not like people have not even like almost got something funded on a shuttle mission once but um something keeps happening and we 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 have no data we have just zero data for how the human body behaves in the midterm and over the long term in a partial gravity environment um, yeah, um nicholas i think and don't quote me on this i think we do have a little bit of data i think they just finished um, collating data from an experiment on the ISS where they spun up rats. Yes, those are not humans, though. So, uh, well, yeah, uh, I mean, no, but, but, but you're right. You're, hey, you're, you're I know right. some humans that come play pretty close to rats. And, and you know what? Rats is better than nothing. And I, I wish that there was more work done on rats. But um, like we haven't, no, seriously. Oh, rats! We've done we've done more ex we've done more uh, partial gravity experiments with uh, different kinds of um, uh, plants and flowers, uh, not flowers, plants and fungi than we have with animals. Sure. And that that thing with rats, I mean, they maybe I'm wrong, but I believe there's only been maybe three and a centripetal animal experiments. Yeah, in the history in the history of space yeah. flight yeah it's very That's not just on the iss and uh just now now we do but on the other hand you're right though ben as soon as you said that i was like oh yeah of course the apollo data like so we do have some rough uh, physiological data for um uh, like biomedical very rough biomedical data for how the human body behaves in 16 percent g um but those were, I mean, it's a miracle that those guys flew and landed and, and got back home again. You know, the bio, the biomedical data that we have is, is very rough, but intriguing. And if, boy, if we could build something, I don't know if you're familiar, Jim, with a, a guy named Gerald Driggers. No. Um, okay, well, he wrote a great book, uh, which I must have downstairs. Uh, uh, and I, I can't remember his, the name of his book right now, but I'm going to look it up. He wrote a great book about um, the need for this. Um, um, and I will look it up and post it in the chat. But anyway, um, I think we should build it and name it after him, the Driggers Research Station. Um, and it wouldn't be, I don't think it would be too difficult, but Boy, it just it just seems like if we can't figure out centripetal gravity, uh, space flight, 
we're stuck in cislunar space. And you can tell me all the, the, you know, all the fancy workarounds for this, you know, drugs and exercise and everything. But if there's anything that we've learned from the ISS, it's number one, how to mitigate the, a lot of the bad effects of microgravity. And two, that it's not enough. Mm -hmm. It's not enough. Yeah. And um, unless, you know, we invent something miraculous, magic like the Epstein drive, uh, we're going to be stuck in cislunar space. Uh, and uh, unless we're the, the people who go, who the, the human beings who make interplanetary space flights will arrive partially crippled and return to Earth in need of years of remedial medical attention. Uh, um, you know, I'm not saying that they're never going to walk again on Earth. They probably will. But, um, you know, just look at, at uh, I believe it's um, Scott Kelly's tweets, you know, about his continuing joint pain and stuff. And it's been years since he got back to Earth. Yeah. Um, and all of that disappears if we have some level of, I mean, obviously 1G, obviously that would be fine and perfect. That's what we're sitting in now. But, but we just don't know, you know, how much is enough? Maybe 10% G is enough of a, of a gravitational field to prevent a lot of those bad microgravity effects. Or, you know, and if 10% is enough, then human beings can live long-term on the moon. But what if we do the research and we find out that 10% is not enough, 15, 18, 25% is not enough? What if we need one half of a G? Well, now humans can't live long term on either the moon or Mars. And, and but we just don't know any of these things. And if until we start doing the centripetal gravity research, we're never going to know these things. Um, I work with science fiction writers every week and they come up with some amazing, wonderful, very plausible, plausible sounding ideas. We just need to test them. We just don't have a data set. Go ahead, Fred. What's going on? You need to yeah, unmute yourself unmute. first. Pardon. And by the way, my mug does say, uh, join humanity's new frontier. Your future awaits you in the Mars colonies. So <laughs> I'm not against, I'm like, I want to go. Fred, you got to unmute yourself. Fred, you're on mute. I can't hear Fred. <laughs> I don't. You, you know, Ben, if you click that little ask to unmute button, then Fred will get a splash mute. screen right in there front of him. There we go. There we go. unmuted now. It's a matter of money. Money. If yep. you get a, a lot of money made from some enterprise in space, uh, it could be applied to um, a building a uh, uh, habitats in space and the whole habitat could be sent to mars with solar sails the the question is do you have enough money for it and the 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 way to get more money is to be able to uh, uh make economic use of, of the moon uh well, one way is to be able to uh, uh recycle uh rocket exhaust from craft that are launched from the moon, capturing the rocket exhaust, making rocket fuel out of it. That's something we don't do on Earth because there's water all over the place, carbon dioxide and a, a, a rocket taking off from Earth. It generates a lot of this stuff and it's worthless. But on the moon, it's not worthless, but we throw it away anyway because we use the moon like we're used to using the Earth. When, when we shouldn't, it's a different place. We should behave differently. And if we uh, would collect the rocket exhaust uh, and uh, uh, turn 95% or more of the uh, used rocket fuel uh, as exhaust back into rocket fuel, uh, we could uh, uh, have a less costly system of of launching cargo into space with the proviso that you'd have to launch an awful lot of cargo. If you just do 10 launches of cargo, building a system to recycle rocket exhaust would be a pretty worthless idea. 
it has to be uh, something as big as uh, uh, space-based solar power, uh, at, at least for the United States and Europe combined, uh, spread it all over the world. But uh, if uh, a system of getting enough money uh, out of space was developed by cooperation with various countries, the, the money would take care of the problem of sending people to Mars uh, without being crippled from a lack of gravity. So Jim is talking about ACEs being a way to influence the people with the money, the space agencies, you know, the major players in the space industry and getting them to work together and getting them to adopt these excellent uh, uh, values that he just described to us. I think it, it's a great idea. I mean, Fred, what you're saying sounds like the kind of idea that would like optimize um, an existing, a, 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 a very mature space infrastructure that just doesn't exist right now. We just need to get that that infrastructure to exist. And if someone's looking for something to throw half a billion dollars at for a research project that would be, you know, very, very, uh, you know, help like timely, very timely as we're on the brink of possibly being able, like at least sending, you know, large, you know, like dozens of tons of hardware to other planets like Mars. Um, it just seems a shame that we can't send a human along also without them coming back crippled or arriving crippled. All right, Ryan, uh, Ryan has a question. Oh yeah, yeah. Go ahead, Ryan. I, w I was thinking, you know, I think I think one thing we should do and, you know, ask as a space community and also <clears throat> as part of the Moon Society is, you know, what's the one thing that we could do that would make enough money to, uh, you know, have a, be a raise, raison d'etre for being in space or on the moon? And I mean, in my mind, I think there's there's two options. One, uh, which is probably so far the best drawn out would be tourism. Um, and, <clears throat> you know, if you could use something like a starship to bring people to and from the moon, like a seven day cruise thing, uh, you know, first being in orbit, eventually landing, maybe then building a hotel there that could be used as a nidus to then grow off, you know, uh, commercial um you know like a commercial city uh where you know it'd be very easy it would, instead of being like almost impossible to set up a business on the moon uh then it would just be you know maybe kind of expensive you know um then that would help seed things and grow things uh the other thing would be uh space solar power and right now there's a lot of push towards green energy you know renewable energy and you know solar power is very difficult on earth because the best you can do is six hours of usable solar power um, and you're limited by the space that you have. Um, but when you're in space, um, you know, as long as your mass limits make sense and maybe it will with Starship, um, you know, you could build, you know, you get 24-7, 365 days a year solar power. There's no uh, rainy days or cloudy days in space. Um, and, um, and, you know, you could build your arrays as large or as small as you want. So, yeah, I mean, I mean, that's my two cents of just, you know, trying to find, you know, the, the two most likely reasons of what would make money to, you know, keep things sustainable. And also, uh, you know, in the second case, I mean, it's something that would benefit all mankind as well, too. So all humankind. So. Yeah. Anybody? Yeah. Well, I mean, <laughs> solar power definitely is one of the big reasons that people give for actually establishing a permanent lunar presence to actually, you know, extract the mass needed to build those things. Because even with Starship, it's outrageous how many launches you'd have to have to build even a medium-sized SPS, and you'd need more of more than one of those to actually make a dent. So. Yeah. The only way you build anything of that size or O'Neill cylinders or any of the other large structures is by mass extraction of lunar resources. Yeah. And I, I feel like the Starship, I mean, it wouldn't be the answer to making it happen, but it could be, you know, you send up some test cases up there. 
you know, like a, some smaller satellites just to, you know, work out the bugs, make sure it works. And then you can kind of do the calculations of, you know, and probably maybe at the same time, if you were uh, establishing a, um, <clears throat> like a tourism type moon base, um, that later you could plug in a manufacturing center for scooping up regolith, uh, refining out the silicon, and then, you know, either launching it off or railgunning it off the moon uh into you know to l1 or something like that uh and then having people up there putting it all together i mean this is all like high frontier stuff but um <laughs> but you know yeah i mean a lot of a lot of infrastructure has to be built first before any of that can actually happen so yeah baby yeah. steps we still we still got to get beyond low earth orbit that's that's the trick yes yeah. and let me just say again hey space tourism that's not a pie in the sky thing that's happening right now mm -hmm. it's like people have licenses people are are actually flying right now um you know there's there's four space companies right now that actually exist and are are operating there's obviously spacex which is the most exciting one to me because if you can afford the ticket price mm -hmm. we can talk about ticket prices later but you can have a three-day uh you know actually productive mission in space there's um uh what do you call that little jeff bezos rocket the little the little one blink um yeah i'm sorry yeah blue origins new shepherd the suborbital one wow what a blast I, I mean uh no pun intended but it it uh it's it's the shortest flight of the three that are flying right now but you know it's going and people are paying money and people are flying on it and it's making good press it's probably the only thing that jeff bezos does that brings him good press but it's working <laughs> and um, you can and, get more and, he owns uh, the he owns what the washington post <laughs> oh please let's not go there so but the the third one that's flying right now and taking customer i believe wait have they taken yeah they've taken their first plane load axiom. of customers haven't they no axiom's the fourth one axiom the one that is that is working and <laughs> do building towards it's yeah, uh, i think they had their first mission yeah virgin galactic is the one that's flying out of new mexico i think but um but yeah virgin galactic is you know actually flying and virgin orbital is sending cargo so like 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 those four companies like aces is actually bending metal and building uh building the the modules that it's going to use for its private you know space basically a space hotel mm -hmm. um so like boy this is and a, a lot of the things that um that people have suggested here now like space power and a uh, space-based solar power and you know recycling um you know exhaust that impinges on the lunar surface that's the kind of stuff that it's just gonna have to you know wait for later but you know uh, what Nicholas said about sports and entertainment, that's that's clearly something that could be worked into the near future. But yeah. but how can we do? How can we? So this is directed to Jim. Jim, how can we? Like we have these ideas. We're like, wow, this wouldn't this be great? How can we? As we talk to other people about these ideas. How can we phrase our passion in such a way that it incorporates the kind of values that that you listed earlier about aces, um, about um, about you know working together and uh, being inclusive and um, uh, what did you say four times collaboration and cooperation instead of uh, competition? Um, yeah. Like, is there? I don't know. Are there? To help me out what what went through your mind when i was saying all that well i think we need to find you know the common denominators that uh, really light the fires uh, under both the public and private sector moving forward and you know if we can establish a set of goals that are collinear and that somehow you know interrelate and by working together you can you know not only accomplish the set of goals, but in so doing, come out ahead of the game uh, in terms of cost reduction, uh, in terms of the efficiency of operations, in terms of accelerating the calendar for 
when you want to get what done by when, you know, to achieve what, and who the key players are internationally that you, you need to pull in public and private uh, to really make it happen. And looking at, looking at it as kind of a puzzle and trying to get all the right pieces to fit together uh, in a way that, you know, maximizes the bonds in terms of being able to achieve the bottom lines that all your players have and demonstrating that by in so doing, you achieve even more. So you have a you know a baseline set of objectives uh, that each group brings to the table. But then it's again, it's I think of the petri dish, and you come up with a very uh, an interesting way of integrating and amalgamating and integrating the resources, the visions, and uh, basically the goals, the time frame that you want to achieve. And if you find some common denominators in that whole process, then I think you've got a, a viable pathway forward. So so I don't think that space tourism is like a common denominator that both the public and the private sector would share. But could space tourism be one of these Petri dishes you're talking about? Well, it, it certainly could. Be. I mean, it's a place it where money be. is already being spent where people are already flying, like hardware is already going up. People are thinking, are st I mean, right now they're just like, oh, oh my God, I'm in space, this is amazing. And then they well, re-enter. But, yeah. but later on, they're gonna be up there and like wonder like, well, okay, here I am. I'm here for four days, what do I do? Yeah, I think it's not just going to space, uh, but I think you, you want to underscore how collaborating in space enterprise can ultimately reduce the competition, enhance the collaboration, and achieve things you wouldn't be able to otherwise. Well, I think, I think with like space tourism, there is a public component because there are things, yeah, standardization of equipment, standardization of safety requirements, that's where public organizations get involved or government organizations get involved. And then once you establish these baselines, then the private enterprise can compete on a level playing field. So, yeah, no, I agree 100%. And by the way, that is one of the top things that the Moon Village Association was talking about back in 2019, uh, which is when I was active with them. <laughs> um, so, but yeah, so tell me that again, because I'm taking notes. Standardization of like hardware fittings and what other standardizations? Because as oh. you said them, I was like, yes, yes, but I well, can't remember Jim, Jim them now. had it on his slides, you know, it's ah. just basically... You want, you want all the equipment to operate together. You don't want four different types of airlocks that don't interact. You don't, everybody needs to be on the same level when it comes to safety requirements, safety procedures. Uh, it's kind of like the airlines, you know, government regulation and, and all, like NASA's technical input and everything has created a baseline that we accept for commercial airlines. And they need to do the same thing for commercial spacecraft. Can I put in one thing about the, the whole regulation thing? Because I, I grew up in Arizona. I've been very anti-regulation uh, most of my life. And uh, I had an interesting conversation with an airline captain. And I'll, let me just sum it up. I, like he completely changed my attitude towards safety regulations for space. Um, and it, it at the end of, the list of number of anecdotes that he told, he held up, because it was like a Zoom meeting, and he held up a big fat book. Oh, first he held up the first book. He said, this is NASA's space flight safety manual. And it was maybe 40 or 50 pages, like thin, it was flimsy, you know, it looked like a magazine. And then he held up this massive thick thing that looked like, you know, the like the Oxford English Dictionary. Oh, it was bigger than any Bible I've ever seen. The thing was gigantic. And he said, this is the FAA flight regulation thing. And he said, it's important to remember that this book was written in blood. That every single one of these safety regulations is because people died because that whatever that regulation was, wasn't there. Even the, the fact that like pilots are required to go through a checklist 
like what we don't trust their memory these guys do it no you have to go through the checklist even that was because of the death of a a, a test pilot who you know that was before they had checklists and he walked around the plane he looked at everything and he hopped in and took off and he never he he died because there was something that he had like left off that he should have turned on and he just forgot yeah he just I, forgot the way i see regulations are if you don't have enforceable regulations then you're trusting companies to do the right thing all the time well that's, that's another thing I'm, I'm talking about from the perspective of the person well, flying and the thing but yes you are also right because, yeah and, and companies don't have an incentive to do the right thing all the time because their primary mission is to make money for a select group of people so regulations are important to keep corporations and companies in line and to make sure that everybody else is at least partially protected um i mean i don't think any of us would get on an airline that didn't follow any of the established safety regulations like you said they're all there for a reason and they're there because somebody screwed up at some point and something happened so and, um, and something, right now something really disastrous happened yeah, it wasn't right now, like space, oh this is inconvenient <laughs> right this is the wild west right now um there are certain protocols that if you're going to fly on you know government vehicles you have to abide by and i think you know um spacex has to abide by certain things if it docks at the iss so there are some rules but they need to have rules that apply to everybody all the time so everybody knows what they're doing at least that's what i think but i agree does anybody disagree with that just curious well i, I disagree with something you said a while back sure so that is uh that uh there there would be recycling of rocket exhaust that impinges on the lunar surface but in order to recycle it you have to capture it first in order to do that one way that would work would be having a 30 mile long tube 12 feet in diameter and the rocket accelerating to orbit speed in that tube the the exhaust would stay in the tube you have it then hey Fred Fred Save it, and why don't you present on that next month? Well, oh, okay, uh, I'll uh, I'll save that until next month then. Okay, well then we'll, I'll pencil you in for for the June presentation. You can tell us all about uh, rocket exhaust capture. Okay, <laughs> cool. Well, one, one, thing I, one thing I'd say about regulations personally is, um, I mean, my view of it is you need to have the regulations to keep things safe. But at the same time, too, you don't want so many regulations that it, you know, just sandbags the whole affair and you can't get anything done. I mean, for instance, my yeah. my wife works as a real estate developer here in Canada. And I don't know if you see much about the news, but we're having a massive crisis here in Canada. Like the price of houses is just skyrocketed. Oh, yeah. People can't find places to live. They can't rent. And, you know, my wife will buy like a single family house and she'll put two or three units in it. And it takes her six, there's so many rules. It takes her six months and a whole lot of effort, you know, just to, just to get the go ahead to do this, right? Whereas if, you know, and half of those rules are probably like 100 years old, right? So if you got rid of the rules that you don't need anymore and you streamline the process and maybe got more people to, you know, you know say, yep, yeah, that's good. Uh, I think that the housing crisis might not have happened or, you know, it might be something that's going to be solved in, you know, a few couple of years instead of, I, I mean, I don't think, I don't think we're ever, <laughs> we'll see if we ever get out of it uh, or how long it takes to fix. But I mean, that's one thing with, with regula regulations is like a lot of times I feel like more new rules are being put in, you know, and, and new rules aren't getting, getting rid of it. You're, you're not getting rid of the old rules and it kind of really slows down things. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's true. You know, the hardening of, of the arteries of society, you know, <clears throat> so. Well, I agree with you 100 percent there. I just, I, 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 I do. I just, I have, I have a much clearer understanding mm -hmm. of how much careful, well thought out regulation goes into safety procedures and safety manuals. So well, I'm talking you, about safety regulations, but the kind of regulations that create barriers to entry, mm -hmm. you know, so that the companies who started in there can keep all the competition out. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, those those don't those don't keep anybody safe. 
um, we don't need those regulations and and regulations that create uh, the regulations that limit our our ability to adapt to changing market situations and changing technological advances yeah those those regulations are not helping anybody mm -hmm. but there's just a whole lot of regulation the kind of regulation that ben is talking about that's so so here's another thing like like I, i'm omitting the the backstory here but um but the next step in the evolution of my understanding of the value of regulations was uh realizing that um oh, there was a really great example that i can't remember right now but um it was completely impossible to do a certain kind of of uh, flight, a certain kind of mission, until someone did it, and and it you know it worked out somehow, generally positive, and um, the data that they got back, um, they gave those that data to an engineering firm that worked for, wait for it, an insurance company. And as soon as insurance policies could be written for that that kind of mission, I think it was an Earth observing satellite, but I'm not sure. Um, yeah, I can't remember. But anyway, as soon as oh, or maybe as a communication satellite, as soon as they got the data that they needed, um, all of a sudden, um, all of a sudden, the uh, insurers were willing to write insurance for it, which means that bankers and investors could finally complete their math equations to see whether or not this was ever going to be profitable or how profitable it would be. Like, finally, they could finish, they could finish the algebra. You know what I'm saying? Well, yeah, and yeah. all of a sudden, a, a billions of dollars of investment were suddenly available. Well, yeah. So if we, if we created this ecosystem with standardization and regulations and safety. All, all that does is like you said, it reduces risk, it retires risk. So investors and, and insurers and customers, everybody knows more about what they're gonna get into. And so that, that's one of the things that needs to happen eventually is that a lot of the unknowns and the risk needs to be retired before you're gonna get major money, lots of customers, that kind of stuff. Yeah. It was just a breakthrough for me to realize that it's not that they're against it. It's not that they don't have vision. It's that they don't have numbers. They yeah, need yeah. data. They need and data. So, and they, yeah. they need data and they need insurance assurances. You know, right. it, it's well risk it's data is one of those things. <laughs> go to the moon to establish a claim if they don't know that they can keep it. Because right. right now, property rights in space is a big question mark. So, oh, that's a big one. So that's, but it's stuff like that. It's all these unknowns. So nobody wants to put money and effort into it because they don't know if they're going to get any money out of it. So, Jim, and that is one area that we can work on, uh, or not we, but like Aces people could work on uh, without without any uh, without needing any kind of aerospace investment, and that's the legal side of things. So. Jim, I know you know the 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 status you know between the United States and Luxembourg, you know, writing legislation that protects or seems to protect a certain amount of private property rights in space in certain ways, without directly contradicting the Outer Space Treaty of 1967. Like it seems like the 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 legal framework could be built right jim is there like are people working on that legal framework as is could aces be influential in 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 you know helping push that forward so that at least in the united states and luxembourg and maybe other countries too who are, would be willing to adopt like ben said like a kind of a standardized law regime under which people can claim ownership of outer space resources, you know, since the land itself is off limits because of the Outer Space Treaty of 1960. Oh, I mean, yeah, I mean, clearly this is something that I think the ACs could tackle. Uh, this particular topic has not surfaced yet, you know, in our ongoing dialogues, but uh, we could introduce this in our next team meeting. Which oh, please really, do. Yeah, 
and and see where that goes. And if you'd like, you know, certainly can send you folks, you know, the, the the time for this in discussion, and you can present your ideas and figure out, you know, who, which other partners we need to bring into this to come up with a viable pathway forward. Uh, but no, I mean the whole idea behind AC is just to figure out ways to collaborate. So, you know, it's in the name and uh, we really want to just bring together the right resources that have common uh, and bottom lines in terms of what they're trying to accomplish and how they want to get it done uh, or explore possible ways of achieving their goals. And then, you know, toss the ideas out and have them circulate around and see if there's any traction. Uh, because I'm ultimately, you can't just be the AC's team. It's, you know, you got to bring in the key international players that say, yeah, this is a great idea. This is why, and this is who's going to contribute what to achieve what by when and come up with a reasonable roadmap or timetable to, uh, to get this done. Yeah. That's one of the interesting, um, uh, 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 I think probably one of the unintended consequences, I don't know, of the OST 1967 is that um, private companies, like the loophole allows private persons or private companies to claim ownership of space resources. But it, it, the wording of the treaty seems to say that governments can't. So that's just a very interesting wrinkle of that whole thing. And that's I don't true. know if the Outer Space Treaty of 1967 is even going to continue to be the treaty framework on which the law is built. It, there, it might be overturned or thrown out or superseded by a different treaty. I don't know. Yeah, that and could be a, a topic for another discussion. Oh, uh, yeah. I, I hate to do this, guys, but I've got a hard stop. Uh, Jim, last words? Well, just up. thank you so much for, you know, listening to my babble. And, oh, thank uh, you. you know, we, uh, I think there's a lot of potential here for collaboration. And we just need to figure out where are the bottom lines that overlap and then figure out how, who can bring what to the table to achieve what by when, come up with a roadmap. And, uh, you know, just a, a strategic path going forward. And that's kind of being built now with ACs, we don't quite have it formalized yet, but we are developing a strategic plan that will have a roadmap in it, so. Okay, well, keep keep me in the loop and I'll keep our members in the loop and uh, we'll see where there's some possible collaboration. Terrific, sounds great. Awesome. And well, thank, thank you for the opportunity to talk about ACs. Yeah, yeah great. Uh, Jim, thank it, you, it was a great yeah. presentation, appreciate it. And thanks everybody for showing up and uh, participating. Uh, again, this this video will be on the the Moon Society YouTube channel. Hopefully next week, if I have time to do it. And uh, we got a next another meeting next month. So, and hopefully Fred will have a great presentation on rocket recycling. Thank you. I look forward to it. Hey, thanks Yay. so much. Thanks everybody. All right. Thanks, thanks everybody. Thanks. Everybody. Aloha. Yep. Aloha. And and Jim. If you want yes. to look more into that idea of, you know, the laws of outer space, I'd recommend contacting Michelle Hanlon. Uh, oh, yeah. She's done presentation. For all mankind. She's the, she's the leader of For All Mankind, right? Well, yeah. and, and, and the National Space Society, and, and, and I, I, I lead their international team from the International Space Society. So, yeah, I'll be in touch with Michelle. Cool. All right. All, all right. Everybody have a good night. Okay. Bye. Take care. Good night. Bye. Bye.